Please call the roll. Belt. Excused. Boren. Here. Carlson. Uh, he'll be here in a few minutes. Decker. Here. Hammond. Here. Hammond. Hmm? Heideman. Here. We're both here. <laughs> Cop. Here. Kittleson. Excused. Matichek. Uh, not excused. Riesler. Present. Sampson. Here. Van Akron. Excused. Vanderweely. Here. And Versi. Excused. Nine present. Uh, let's all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, next, we have the approval of the minutes from the December 14, 2011 meeting. So move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. Number five, we have a public forum uh, on agenda items. Anybody want to speak at the public forum? Anybody want to be heard at the public forum? And for the third time, does anybody want to be heard at the public forum? Chairman's comments. I want to recognize the few people in the audience tonight. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Sheboygan County Sheriff Todd Preby. And we have Inspector Bill Brookbauer. And we have uh, County Supervisor Epping, I believe, from the Plymouth area. Welcome. <clears throat> Then we go down to items for discussion only, item number seven, a presentation of changes in communication with City of Sheboygan officials in navigating the City of Sheboygan website. Uh, it'll be presented by uh, Chad Pelichek, the City of Sheboygan Development Manager, and Dave Augustine, the City of Sheboygan IT Manager. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. up here and I'm going to navigate here and you guys are going to navigate there. I'm going to start out by just kind of running through the website changes just to help uh, familiarize people with the new site, what's on it, what's available. And then we're going to get into some specific communication request information, building code, those types of things and how that whole new system works. So um, let's just, looking on here, um, this is the new home page. Uh, as you see it and basically what you see across the top is uh, the very top is the the Sheboygan website the county chamber website a tourism website and then the Sheboygan County tourism website that header is the same on all of those um, those sites are all integrated into one they're being hosted by one provider so we save money across the board uh, the chamber and the county tourism uh, group uh, they all kind of pitch in and it's a one hosting fee and it's integrated throughout the website. So you'll see that if you go to each one of these individual ones, which we're not going to go to for time. But um, on the next line is the agendas and minutes. That's if people haven't been there, there's a number of places on the website to go and see committee agendas and minutes and committee members and those types of things that were on the previous website. Um, you know, if you going there, it's, there's a, at the home page, there's you know the listing of all the committees with the date that the last agenda was posted on the far right, and then a copy of all of uh, listing of all of the city committees. Um, most of them have a description of what the committee's purpose is. Um, a couple line sentence here: the board license heating uh, HVAC contractors, and then if there was any agendas and minutes, and then the members are underneath. Um, the next tab over is a calendar. Uh, this is really, you know, if, if, if there's events that this is, we're treating this as a city calendar, not just a meeting calendar. So if there's um, events that, 
you know, people think should be on there for the entire city to know of. It's set up to be different colors represent different things. Currently, it represents the agendas that are posted for the current meetings, but, um, you know, we can have uh, events and different deadlines and things on there. The fire department uses it when they're doing uh, training in the early part of the year, you'll see on that calendar. Um, if they're out in the, in the schools doing school training, there's a lot of events on that. So it's got a multiple facet use and, and people, you know, there's, there's these different categories for that. So what I, in the handout that I handed out is a quick guide for navigating the website. And if you, um, you know, it says on there, if you've got under the calendar, if you've got, you know, any kind of request for posting on the calendar to contact the clerk's office and they can help you with that. Um, across the top, news releases, that's if there's any news press releases that are issued, usually if they're sent to the media, they're posted here. Um, voter information has really been key in the first election and in the future elections. This is where, how to find where you vote, um, you know, that voter public access website and then it lists all of the current district maps as part of the redistricting so it has this overall map as well as zeroed into the specific districts and then there's some other information available on the bottom um, and then the request info we'll get into that shortly but that really is where we're looking for residents and citizens and even older persons to communicate with departments um, this is, I'll, I'll just run through this quick, but this is really been set up for building code. You'll see up there building code violations, request form, uh, tall grass, snow removal, abandoned vehicle, graffiti, garbage, dog issues. And then on the bottom of this is all other general information. And this is really the way, if, if you're getting a constituent calling in and you know, has a concern about a particular property, we're asking you to go to this system versus sending an email to that department head um, or a person within the city and hoping that there's a response. What we found is there's been a number of um, communications that have come in and fallen through the cracks and weren't either followed up on or didn't get to the proper people. With this new system, um, by going in here and, and I'll, going through and filling it out, Dave will share how the whole tracking system how the whole tracking system works on the back end. So as the complaint comes in, we can see who it's been assigned to, if there's an answer provided, what that answer was, and send the response back out to the citizen. That's the new um, kind of back end part of this from the website. Uh, so, you know, under, it's pretty self-explanatory. There's, the fields are required if, you know, if you get a, as an older person and you get somebody that calls in, they don't have access to a computer and you want to do it for them, but they don't have an email, you can put your, what we're recommending is you need an email address so you can put your email address in there and then you'll get a response back from the system as we're going through and answering the request. Um, and then in the, you know, how can we help if, if it's a specific question, we get a lot of questions off of this thing today. For example, we got one of somebody looking for a property reassessment form and they couldn't find it and then there was assigned to the department, the assessor's department, and they emailed that form to them. So, you know, there's a lot of different requests that are coming in, but it really allows, you know, a wide variety of things and what we're really trying to do is streamline and get people using this system so we can track the requests. Um, you know, if, and, and Sue, this, Sue is going to start, has actually started using this system as well. Down at the bottom here, you can include a document or a photo. Um, so a lot of communication that comes currently into the council and, and it's referred to a committee and a lot of that stuff is stuff that can be done by the department and it doesn't necessarily need to be on the council agenda. Um, it, and it, you know, at that stage at the, that the department head feels it needs to go to a council for generating of an ordinance or whatever that, you know, then it can be forwarded. But a lot of the communication safety issues, I want a stop sign, I want this, I want that. You know, a lot of times it goes to a committee and the, the staff is recommending filing it because it's been handled already by the department. This is really a system that allows uh, Sue as she gets a communication in her department to upload that letter, send it through the system, and then we can track it and the department can follow up on it. And it really cuts down on you know, waiting 
three weeks or whatever it takes for it to finally get back to council and either be, be approved or denied. You know, there's some things that aren't going to be able to go through the system, but you know, most communications, we're going to try sending it through here because Sue had said the reason a lot of the communications had been sent to the council is there was really no way of tracking where the documents was, so this was one way of doing it. So we're kind of doing it on the, you know, on this side without sending everything to committee and council. So as where we are today right now, is there any questions on this request form? Because I think this is, you know, this is, these areas are really the, you know, the biggest areas and there's a lot of people. In six months, the abandoned vehicle graffiti, garage, uh, garbage and dog issues had 78 online requests. So as the request, as the information gets out there to the residents, um, and that's part of the reason for this meeting is to really t show people what's here. This is a way of communicating with officials and making sure that your requests are followed up on. Then um, we'll, I'll, we'll run through how that whole system works and Dave will share that with you shortly. I'll just keep going. Uh, under the, at any stage you can go back to the home page by clicking on the city logo and it brings you to the home page. And really what I wanted to just show you is there's a rotating banner on here um, that we update with information that's uh, happening at the time. And then on the far right here is, this is actually Twitter feeds. Um, right now I think the city has 70 or 80 some Twitter fans uh, that receive this. So what we do is, we go to a Twitter account on the back end and type this information in and then it populates our website automatically and then it goes to all the people that are Twitter friends or are tweeting or you know that type of thing. So it's really a way of communicating and, and that's where the social media policy came from is making sure that we're getting stuff out there that's you know legit and, and having a little control over that. Um, and then the rest of the website it's really geared around economic development, business creation. You'll see our, our partners and those types of things. And then really there's a citizen info zone where it's a, a repeat of a lot of stuff, but it's quick references to get to um, different areas. And then when we go back to um, the officials page, if, I don't know if you, we've been keeping this up to date. It'll change obviously with the redistricting and we'll be working through that. Um, it gives, uh, residents are able to go in and see the district three wards three uh, three and five and six as they currently stand you know the pictures that we took in the early part of the council year so um, you know and what the committees are it's the same contact information that was on the previous site um, under the departments tab there's a lot of information here a lot of departments have come on board and are looking at if they've got uh, licenses, applications, and different permits and different things that the public needs to get. Those have all been put on here as PDFs so that they can be downloaded so you don't have to call the department. Um, you know, so there's, we're looking at uh, under the, and this has kind of been, I'll just go here, the building inspection department um, talks about all of the divisions. You can get all the building permit applications, everything online. Um, the vacant building registry, which it's been a big talk lately, um, has the ordinances posted here and then if people call you, how do I register my property, you can do it online. There's a form here, there's a number of fields they have to fill in, uh, but it allows them to do it here and it takes about five minutes and it's really easy, you just hit submit and you're done. Um, that information is being tracked on the back side of the website as a spreadsheet. Uh, we download it every week and provide it in a shared directory to the departments that need that information. So as they're out in the field and they have a particular property, they can find whether that's, if it is vacant, who the contact information is. Um, the other, some of them, uh, city attorney, city clerks, there's a lot of information on their stuff. Uh, finance, fire department, human resources, we're working on an online employment application process, so there's going to be more coming on that soon. Um, information technology, the Mead Library, some of these just really connect into current, uh, current sites that are already available, um, and there's some of them that have been revamped. So, you know, it's a work in progress. The police department, they have uh, redone their website recently to kind of mimic what the city's website is. Um, 
the format of the city's website with their information on it. So, you know, it's open to departments to expand out and we can have it all under kind of one umbrella, but it's, uh, and it's got the same format, so it's the same look and feel across the board. Um, let's just get out of here. Under the history and info page, this has uh, information on st city statistics, museum tours, library resources. This is a city map that actually uh, goes into Google. And one of the interesting things about this is, um, you know, just like any Google map, you can zero into a particular area and then you can, up on the top right here, it even has the satellite like Google has so you can see the aerial of it. Um, and then zoom in, so if there's anything that you want to see, this is current and it's on, it's just linking into Google and the website. Um, and then there's a tab on here for people that are interested in landmarking their property through historical means. Then the business tab, this was set up to be kind of a, a one-stop shop for all the business resources that a new business coming into town might need. Um, the available sites and buildings that ties into the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation's website and their listing of uh, properties that are available. Uh, business incentives, it talks about what we have available as a city for a new business. Um, a startup guide is you know, how to navigate through the city because it can be kind of overwhelming what the number of departments a new business has to go to. Um, and then it really gets into specifics about permits and zoning and applications, the business center, um, South Pier development, it's got <clears throat> Uh, what what's available, what sites are available, the history of it down in the bottom. It talks about design guidelines and opportunities. Um, we're working on a page for the Willow Creek Business Center. This is a, still a work in progress. We're going to start marketing this property that there's development opportunities and kind of what our master plan is for that. Um, and then the zoning code uh, in districts is available and there's been a huge request for people that want to know what the city's zoning map, where it's available so they can see how properties are zoned. So we worked with the, this is a huge document, but we worked with uh, engineering and was able to get the most current that's in the third floor conference room. That map is now available <coughs> online as well. So people don't have to always be calling and saying, what's the zoning on this parcel? They can drill in and get that information. Um, and then, the last tab is really about the residents. Um, it's got a number of resources on it from assessment data to employment. We're working on a new housing opportunities. We get a lot of requests from people that are moving into the area and they want to know how, how do the, you know, what kind of housing is available. How do I get in touch with somebody about renting an apartment? What are, you know, where are apartments located? So we're working through on that information and that really, that changing of this site to add that was really a, because we got an ongoing request for information off of the website of people who were saying, I'm moving to your area, I'm relocating and I need to find housing, can you help me? So, you know, we're kind of answering the question that we got with the information right there so we don't you know, hopefully minimize our questions. And then it just talks about municipal codes. You can find your neighborhood officer, um, poll information. This is again, the same thing about that previous one about reporting uh, violations. It's just another way of getting to the page. Um, and then uh, there's another news category, the uh, Sustainable Sheboygan Task Force, some voter information and parking rules. And then um, the, the other thing I just wanted to mention is, you know, the, the n people that are trying to access, you can access, and I'm assuming this is how older persons access the email. Um, that's the employee login on the back side of it, um, you know, so we can have remote access to the email and any city employee uh, can have that, so that's still the same. So, oops, now I'm, now I'm broke. Okay, now I need help. Just type in the address up at the address bar again. 
So the other thing I just wanted to mention before I would turn it over to Dave to just kind of run through the inquiry system that we've developed is we to try to streamline and make it easier on what is a city's website. We secured a new link and you'll see that on there, cityofsheboygan.info. We'll direct you to the city's website as well as ci.sheboygan.wi.us, which is a little mundane. So we felt that you know, in marketing efforts and moving forward, where all the departments are being asked as they update webs, update uh, business cards and letterhead and all that to include the city of Sheboygan.info as an easier way of trying to get to the city's website. So if if there's any specific questions, I can you know run through them. There's a lot of information you can check it out on your own. But I would like Dave to just kind of run through the new citizen inquiry system and how that works, so that the people on the back end know what they're going to be seen as we move forward. Any questions? <coughs> Citizen Montemer, did you have a question? Yes, yes, sir. I, uh, very good. Chad, it looks great. Uh, on the complaint side, of, if a citizen calls in and, and and state that say my neighbor's grass is too high, do they identify themselves as a complainant? Now, is it is, a, is it an open record? type situation now? They do, but if you were to call in on the phone, we're going to ask you what your name is anyway. Um, so, you know, whether you put it online or you put your name in here, you know, it's the same thing. I, you know, I, sometimes we get anonymous requests, but, you know, we, we're really striving to try to get contact information so we know who to follow up with. The reason I'm asking this is because uh, the way we normally would say that a, a citizen would call it in result of your alderman then would take care of it, follow me? And then and, the alderman would take care of it. And the alderman can still take care of it. The citizen can call the alderman, but instead of the alderman emailing that department head directly, we're asking them to go on the system and submit that request. So they could be, the alderman could be the person filling out this request on behalf of their constituent and just say there's a problem at, you know, 123 Martin Avenue. Uh, that needs to be looked at and it's the, the alderman then would be the person that would be getting the follow-up So it would be it would be the same thing if, if somebody wanted to remain anonymous What we're trying to get away from is where there's individual emails going to individual departments And if the people don't follow up right away, then it's there, you know These things aren't followed up in a timely manner, you know, they kind of fall through the cracks so we're trying to, it's the same thing here versus emailing the department head. You're just submitting it on the city's website and it'll be assigned to that department head. Yes. Like a follow -up. Is the concern, is the concern whether if you go directly as a citizen and, and put the complaint in, if your information is going to be available for somebody to see? Right. Is that the concern? That's the concern. Okay. So if, if I, as a citizen, made the complaint, my information is not going to be made available to the person I'm complaining about. No, it'll be, it's be completely anonymous. Correct. It's not it'll be a, it'll be assigned because you know most of the, it'll be assigned to the appropriate department department, and they're going to follow up on the complaint. And then the only reason we're asking for contact information is so that we can get back to you and let you know that we took care of the complaint. Right. Right. But if somebody wants to really remain anonymous, then you know you can still go through your older person and they just submit the request on on their behalf, like they're going to send an email to the. Uh, department head, they're going to send the email through the city's website. Thank you. That's, that's where I was my question. I think Chief Demogowski has something. Yeah, just a reminder, uh, we are on television tonight, so the older persons, you need to use your microphones. Chief Demogowski? I just want to touch on that a little bit. I think one of the things that, that we have to try to push out and stress as department <coughs> heads and as city officials is that if people have a concern and they want some action taken, many times us knowing who they are helps us to address that concern. <coughs> letters and, and such to me that are anonymous that have very little detail that makes it very difficult for us to go and, and address a concern where if we have information to follow up with somebody and say, we went there, we didn't see anything, is it taken care of, or could you provide more information, that is very important. So trying to stress it, it, that everybody can do everything anonymously to get things Thank you, Chief. Okay. Dave? Thanks, Chad. When we put this process together, 
there was a group of us designing it and just to give you a little history <coughs> email is a great tool but a lot of times with email assumptions are made well if I carbon copy this person I th I'm assuming they're going to take care of it well that may not happen or there's no way to track it so that's why we came up with this system and right now Chad and I are the gatekeepers or we watch you know what's coming in to make sure it gets routed to the proper departments and we even had you know a meeting at our department heads meeting this past money and we got the contacts for each department so we're training people and we are making them aware that when these messages come through this is what we need to do so we have a system down pat with that the other thing to bring about with this is all this process that we did streamlining to get it all under one process instead of 10 different ways because 10 departments may do them 10 different ways it's one process and we are actually using tools programs that we already have in-house, so to add this was no cost. It's all programs we have already, we just developed it and made it run. What did it take us initially, Chad, a half hour to 45 minutes to get the initial workflow up, and then it's just a matter of adding other things to it. So it, it was really quick to get it up, which is where we want to go. So we're, with the whole website and with this, these types of tools, that's the direction we want to go, to give people, citizens, employees, all their persons, information at their fingertips were possible. So, uh, turn me down a little bit. <laughs> okay, where I wanted, if you can, if you'll indulge me first, is, there's the mouse. Uh, Chad had mentioned the vacant listing um, registry. I just wanted to show you how we are keeping track of that internally on our intranet site, what we put together is um, all site contact, tent. Oh, I gotta go to departments, building inspection. That's where we put it, sorry. There we go. And then we have our lists. I'm taking a long way to get to this. Here we go, vacant building registry. So this is where the current information is out on our intranet site where people can look at you know what's all out there and they can search and if they want to then see um, the whole information that from the website this is where it all is at our fingertips so you don't have to worry about having Microsoft Excel on your computer or you know do I have access to the S drive any device they can get to it this way so that's how we're organizing it so just to give you a show for that so we'll go back to the city website and when, it, when anybody clicks on the request for information, as Chad had shown earlier, um, you can submit code violations, tall grass, abandoned. But what I'm going to do for this example is just put in a general request and where everything where there's an asterisk, that's a required field. So I will put in my name. And then I'm going to put in my address. with the city being Sheboygan, state of Wisconsin, 53083. And then phone number, which is area code required. And then my email, which I'm gonna use my city email for this exercise. And then how can we help? This is a, like a type. This is a demo, bang. And this is where you'd ask a question, if I had a file, I could attach it, but I'm just gonna submit it. What's happening now is this is going to our back end system where Chad and I will get an email notification that hey, there's a new, there's a new inquiry out there that we need to address. But I'm gonna cheat and go right to the site so it's there. Okay, all site content. And then this is a list that I'm taking just a different way. I've got other links for this as well. So here we go, inquiries from outside. So this is the list that's out here now. And answer provided, completed. I'm just waiting for it to come through. And there it is. You'll see now, here's the new request that came through. So when Chad and I get an email, we'll come out to it, and then the first option is we're going to take a look at it, and then here's what the citizen 
had all entered. And one thing nice with here, when it comes in, if once the address is entered, we can do a map. It'll bring up a Google map, too, of it, so that way we can see exactly where it is if we have to. So then what Chad and I will do is take a look and properties. There it comes. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign it to whoever this, you know, based on the content. And what I'm going to do for this exercise is I'm going to assign it to myself to show you how it works. And then I just mark the status to be assigned. At this point, when this is done, two things happen. The person who this is assigned to will get an email saying there's an activity for you to address the Andrew provide an answer to, and then with the email in, the citizen will get confirmation back that we did receive your request, and we assign it to somebody, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. So two things happen there. Number one was communication to the public who sent it in, and number two, the person who it's assigned to is getting notification to act on it. Okay? And let me go to my email. Let me do a refresh. And here you can see two things that happen, just to show you. Number one is this is the notification that we got that was added, our initial thing, and then here's the other one for me. I'm getting, okay, this has been assigned to me, and here it even has the instructions on what to do for the person who it's assigned to. You know, it just goes right through. So they can go to the link right here, and it'll open it up for them. They can look at it. Okay, all the same information. How can we help? This is a demo. So I'm going to go in and do an edit and basically go, thanks for, thanks for sharing. And then as the assigned person, I'm just gonna go, the answer is provided. And then I'm gonna copy the email address. Copy into there, paste, and then I'm gonna do a save. Once I come back to it. There we go. Down here, save. And then what's gonna happen is then once the answer has been provided, Chad and I will get a notification saying, okay, the answer is provided. We need to review it and then send it out to the citizen. So we'll go back in. And even here you can see somebody just submitted a garbage junk dog complaint that just came in from the public. So it is live and people are using it. <laughs> so we do edit item and you can see how it's all there ready to go. So all Chad and I have to do is say, okay, this looks good. Send the reply and then bang, it goes out to the citizen with their answer in a nutshell. And then here you can actually see what the status of certain um, or what the items are. Um, we started with this, you know, back in November, so we have a history of what we're getting, and um, this will pick up with more volume once, you know, the word gets out that we do it. But in a nutshell, that's how the process works. And that's with the complaints, whatever, you know. Or if anybody just has a general question, they can come through and it'll get answered. And then what this also tracks is, um, when did it come in? It's completed, when did we complete it? So this also gives us some benchmarks that we are meeting our requirements within the 10 days to reply to something. So we can run statistics that way too. Can you open up the one from Tracy Berman? Sure. This one here? Yeah. This, is, this, is, this one is an example of what, what a person that got a complaint would do. Tracy Herman is the person that is the, the permit clerk in, in building inspection, and she got, yeah, she got a complaint from the neighbor across the street stopped in to report. So this is really an anonymous complaint, if you will, um, where they this reported it, and somebody within the city sent, went on the website and submitted the request. So as an employee of building inspection, she put the building inspection email in there, her phone number, the address of the violation from the person that came to the window, where the specific location is and what the problem is. So this is really a good example of 
of what, you know, if somebody would call an older person or, you know, somebody didn't want to, you know, went to the window or went to a department and made a complaint. So like Sue Richard's office and a lot of the departments that would get these things were asked, have been asked to submit these reports this way. And if you don't have an email to just use, you know, like she here in this case, she's just using a generic building inspection email. So, you know, this is a good example of kind of what Lee was bringing up prior. So that's pretty much how the process will work or how it does work. So. Any questions? Thank you, Dave. Okay. I'm just going to close some of this out. Okay. Moving in the board docs then? Yes. Uh, the next item on the agenda, uh, number eight, uh, I'm going to wait on that one and move up agenda item number nine, which is a presentation on board, board docs, the online council document system, and the electronic voting system presented by uh, Dave Augustin, City of Sheboygan IT Manager, and Susan Richards, City Clerk. since we first talked about this subject <laughs> as far as paperless. Um, board docs, this is the solution we went with for hosting our council meeting, minutes, agendas, notes online. Online, instead of um, going with paper packets. And we went with this service and what we'll be doing are allow people, the public, yourselves, employees, whoever, to look at agendas posted online through this tool that uh, Sue Richards will be doing. She has a draft out here of the upcoming agenda for Monday. For Monday's council meeting. Mm -hmm. So we'll be able to see that. Uh, we'll be putting a link on our website, probably on the front page. Yes. To start with, and then where we have the existing Genesis. Meetings and minutes will link there as well, but we'll link right into the board docs meeting with it so that way we'll be able to go to the same spots. Okay. To just like with the citizens inquiry, the website or this, if you have any type of a device like an iPad, smartphone or whatever, you can get access to it. So, okay. The process is. Um, Documents will come into Sue as they did before with you know her timelines. And then what she's going to do is make the agendas in this system instead of typing up Word documents and then printing them out and making multiple copies and all that. It can be all done right online. Since we don't have anything live yet, we're going to go into this draft meeting, which will be posted when? Friday sometime. Friday sometime. We'll put it live so it'll be out there. So you can look sometime Friday. We'll have the link out there. And then when you click on it, it'll take it out there. Um, from there, we can view the agenda. And then here's how it starts to look by our opening meeting. Pledge of Allegiance, the approval of minutes, resignations, mayor's appointments, and so on through the agenda. Um, confirmation of mayor's appointments, public forum, mayor's announcements. We get into hearings, and then we get into our sub categories where then like I said here we'll have the meeting February 6th regular common council meeting where all the information will be here online 
as well as then the hearing document will be right here so we can click on that and there's the actual PDF document that we'll get at online. And then it just keeps going down. You know the list, here's the consent agenda with all the items on it. If you can click on one, here's all the detail on it. And likewise, here's the supporting documentation on that. That this one is scanned in as a PDF and then posted. As you can see, resolutions it follows just like the normal agenda. Only everything is online that we can kind of go through. The other thing that can be done is the ability to print out the agenda from wherever you're at, and there's different views. There's a simple agenda which gives you the high level. Then there is, so that's the current agenda, excuse me, the detailed agenda which gives you everything. You know, if you're into detail, if you want to print this out or view it from home and follow along. And then we have the simple agenda, which is, you know, your high level things to talk about <coughs> in the hearings and then just the sub points that can be go through. So if you wanted to bring, you know, an agenda along with you, you could print it out at home or whatever supporting documents, you know, you wanted to do. As far as that goes. Anything else I need to add? No. Or if you wanted to add some comments to it? Yeah, I, what I found is that um, it's a different format, but it's basically the same thing. Excuse me, I've got a really deep voice today. Um, it's basically the same thing we're gonna have the division of the division of documents by number one section is the opening, the beginning part of the meeting. Number two would be the hearings. Number three would be, and so on and so on. Um, the wonderful part about this is that, for instance, for Monday night's council meeting, so far this is what you would get, and we'd be copying right now and tomorrow and Friday. This is what you would get. By doing this, this is the entire agenda, so you can tell the difference. The entire agenda and all the documents minus the attachments. Now you can look at the attachments online, which is terrific, and especially for, I think this is just a, this is a boon for the public, because they've never been able to see the documents themselves. They can look at the agenda, and they can look at the little paragraph that I do a summary on, but they really never see unless they come to our office and pay for a copy or they go or they call and we scan or whatever it is that we do. Now they can literally go on to the site and they literally can go through. They will see every single document. Um, for instance, the one that's up there right now, they will see that document is coming in and then all of the letters that came in with it, any documents, that past documents, whatever it is, they can follow right through, and it's like having the council pack that we've always done forever. So the amount of paper obviously would drop and will drop drastically. The, the difference will be is that you as aldermen will need to obviously access this before the council meeting because you will want to you know, peruse this. You probably want to look at the detailed agenda. When you click that print, did you click the this one print here? icon? Yes. When you, on any of the documents, if you print that, or if you hit that print, you go to the detailed agenda, you can literally go through every single thing and look at it and then just make notes for yourself for that Monday night's meeting. Look, this is a controversial issue. I want to look at the attachments. I want to bring up this. But are you going to do that for all of them? Probably not, because I'm not sure you've done that before. You don't need to for most of them. Um, so you'd have to, this is one thing that you would have to make a commitment to, you know, look at the documents ahead of time because you're not going to have them in front of you when you come here on Monday nights. Um, it, it's so complete that we probably will be able to pull out of here the minutes. We'll, we'll be able to pull what's in here to the minutes. We will probably be able to pull what's in here to the uh, statute required synopsis that we do for the press. So once we get this here, 
it to me, it's just a, it's a godsend for us. It's a godsend for everybody. I think the public is going to love it because anyone that's interested is going to be able to sit there all weekend if they want and read what we do. And truly, I mean, that has been lacking for years and years and years. And this, this is total transparency. There's nothing more that we have that's not in this document. So, you know, big contracts, everything. If we're having a contract for entering into a contract for whatever, the whole contract will be attached to the document so everyone can read it. So I'm really, really excited about it. And I think it's just training ourselves to get away from, it's always been like this. And I think if we just kind of go slowly and it's, pretty easy. It really is. I, I enjoy it thoroughly. The other thing which will be nice for yourselves and the public is there's a search capability. So if you want to search through the whole history and you're looking for a certain item, all the meeting, the minutes, the documents attached are all indexed. So if you want to search through, it's going to give you all the hits to look up for history instead of going through every agenda item and going back and forth. Yep. So how much would you say your time is from Preparing an agenda now versus using this difference? Um, there's a lot of pre-time versus the copying time afterwards. Um, at this point, I would say we're breaking even. However, we're not using any paper. You know, we're breaking even time-wise, but we're not using all the supplies. It's just causing me more time in the pre-thing because I'm the one that's doing it. So where I was usually just creating the documents, now I'm creating them getting them loaded, you know, organizing them and that type of thing. We'll know more as we go along, but it's, to me, it's just. And this is the first agenda that we put together. I right. mean, it'll get better as a process because now what the other thing this allows us to do is save templates so we can save an agenda as a template. You copy it to a new one, right. take out, put in, and then away you go. Right. And what we're going to do for this next meeting on the 6th is we are going to run with paper copies and this for the first meeting so that you will have this available online and you will get a packet. But then after that, you won't need it. It's pretty easy. Anyone okay. have any questions about it? Is the uh, fast track document that you passed out in October, is that still a useful document? That was when we had this presentation the first time back in October, you passed out this fast track signing, first it starts in signing into board docs, viewing upcoming meetings, viewing archive meetings, viewing policies, search for single agendas, searching all agendas. Pretty much. Yes, that would still, that would still be a valid document. Okay. And we will also have, um, we will probably, until we figure out some technology that we can have signatures via computer, I will always be printing one master copy because we have to have signed contracts so this would be my one copy that would be made until we come up with a plan to, because you all still have to sign your documents and that type of thing. And that's just the workflow we'll have to work out because we're looking at something like that and building inspection already with permits. So it's just a matter of work, working out the workflow. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just for everybody's uh, refresher, um, our, the website address, um, are you guys going to post? I know you're going to put a link, I'll but is there a way we could email. for the mm -hmm. aldermen to get an email, that website address if they didn't yes. write it down or weren't yeah, here last I, year? Yeah, I, I can email that to all of you. That'd be great. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Anything else, Sue or Dave? Well, we can go into the other part of this that will help us document in because board docs will be our history and where our minutes will be as well as voting and I just wanted to go through the voting technology that we have from Turning Point or what we call our clickers <laughs> and those are the white devices in front of you right now and each device is assigned to a specific alder person so that's how we excuse me that's how we keep track by the ID so your name is on a label on the back of it okay um, you can leave them here after you're done and they will be there before the meetings, obviously. So you don't have to take them with you because this is the only place they're going to work. So as far as that goes. And what this will allow us to do is you know how you called roll call before, Julie? This is something we can do now is, as an example, here we have council member roll call. 
I mean, we're expecting 15 people. So this is how we can take a roll call. And you'll see right now we have polling is open. So if you pick up your clickers and press 1 to mark as your present, you can see the responses start to come in. So, and you can press 1 as many times as you want. It's only going to take one registration. On it, so you can't. Like if you're voting on a resolution and you want it to get through, you can't hit I 15 times. It just won't take it. So. Yeah. So once... Um, Everybody's voted or clicked. We can then go and say, okay, we have 10. 10 who are present. And that means we have a quorum. And now what we can do is after, with all of our voting, we can take notes and then incorporate that into our board docs minutes to run the reports out here to see who was always present. Or if we want to see right here on the screen, we can see you know, who is all here and I didn't put my participant list, but all the names will come up as far as who, who is all present. So we can get those reports right out of the system. In fact, I'm going to cheat and go back and change my participant list to common council. So we can do this again. Turning point, reset, session. No, I don't want to save the data. Boom. Okay, let's do this again. If we're not here, do we hit two? <laughs> no. Be nice. Okay, polling is open again for council members if you want to press one. Somebody didn't vote for it because now we got 11 and it says unless somebody's cheating and grabbed another one. Uh, uh, it was not. <laughs> so that way polling is closed, roll call is entered. Now we have 11 and now if we want to see who is present, here are all the people who are for roll call and then we can take that and put it into the board docs for the roll call as far as part of our documentation. So, and that's why you have to keep your device because you are assigned a device ID per each thing. So that's why the one that you have, that's why we put your names on the back of it, okay? Then as we're going through, you know, this I can minimize. Then if we're going to board docs, we're doing our agenda and talking, now it's time to call for a vote. We can then come back up. Go to the next, let's say we're on resolution number 6.1 and I just made that up from the current slide. So now we can see, okay, the, the poll is open for voting on resolution 6.1. Pressing one will indicate yes, two is no, three is abstain. So if you wanna vote now. Okay, we have 11 votes, everybody vote. Okay, the polls are closing. And here we can say seven no's, <laughs> three abstains, one up, and then one. So this gives us our counts right here of how we voted on this resolution. And then can you pull up then uh, with the yes, no's, and abstains, what, how, who voted what? Yes. Yeah, who voted okay. yes. I can use the same thing. I just got to get this yeah. so the responses come in because right now a three is abstain, two is no, one is yes. So in this case... Call the person Carlson, voted abstain. Call the person Katz, said no. Call the person Hammond, said abstain. And then we have all no's and then. Who's the one? I just put the one. Yeah. <laughs> You're agreeable to anything, aren't you? So. Just throw the number up there, Neil. <laughs> so this is a way to quick view how people voted. If we want to do this, or like I said, we can run reports after the council meeting and get them into the board docs so that way the public and everybody will be able to see. How, um, how the votes were. And then, like I said, here's the last one, but we, I think we pretty much got the idea of it. So that's pretty much the clicker voting. Any and we'll be one? using that starting Monday night also? Um, who said that? <laughs> Push one. <laughs> yeah. Push one. <laughs> <laughs> we will definitely try to get it in. There. Okay. I may I may need to be there to help with assistance because it's <laughs> going to be a little overwhelming for one person who hasn't done this before, running the board docs as well as running the clicker software. But we'll make it happen.
Anything else you wanted to cover under this, Dave or Sue? Did we talk about that we're going to hand them out the night of and collect them the night of? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's right. If you lose it, it's $75. That's going on my keychain. No, it's not. <laughs> no, we can administer them here. We'll have them out there on your desk and then we'll collect them again. All right. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll go back to agenda item number eight, a presentation of the combined dispatching services technology analysis of January 14th, 2012, presented by Dave Augustine, City of Sheboygan IT Manager. Okay, thank you. This is a document that I put together for the Shared Services Committee when we were talking about the combined dispatch to talk about the technology parts of it or the technology needs direction we should go. So I painted a little picture as far as what our current environment is and then where we want to go. And to go from the top, our current environment is we have the city dispatching for the city of Sheboygan at the city police department and then the technology connections is, is we have a wireless microwave link to City Hall, so we have a single link to City Hall, and then what we do is we have a fiber connection over to the county at the courthouse, where then county dispatching goes on. And then each of us have our own internet connections to the internet, where at the city, obviously, we have our network, the city servers, as well as running city applications, and then the same thing over at the county where they have their network, their applications, and the Spillman server, which hosts the crime software that police and fire use right now, okay? And with this, um, like I said, they're both pretty much separate environments. Um, also, just to show with our internet connection coming in the city hall, um, the Kohler Police Department, Plymouth, the Police Department, Sheboygan Falls, our city of Sheboygan police squads, as well as our city fire department rigs, all get their connection to Spillman through the internet connection to City Hall and then go across to, to the county to get it and come back. Likewise, the county has their internet connection where their primary is their county squads, Elkhart Lake, and then their other affiliations um, go to there and then they have a redundant link, um, their data radio that they use for if the, if the cellular service goes out. So what I did is I, as the team was talking, we had some recommended minimum changes where we could upgrade our communication links between the two of us, meaning the city and courthouse, to gigabit fiber, which, is t which would be obviously 10 times the speed of what we have now to handle additional traffic. Uh, dispatching PCs would be placed on either network, the city or the county, so we're working uniform with that, that function. So it's one email system, one network so there's no going back and forth to make communication easier. Um, allow the traffic to pass through. Have our Windows networks talk to each other so like what you saw with our SharePoint site or intranet site that they could, the county folks could access it without having to give another ID and likewise vice versa you know for whatever applications we would need to access at the county and that can be all done and kept through security. Um, and then obviously what this would do is build a closer relationship between county and city IT relationships. Now where this was going is, again, talking about the combined dispatch of the technologies, you know, that we could leverage with that, so to paint the picture. Um, with that, what I did then is presented a longer term picture of how it would look. David? Yes? Can you talk about what would happen, say, if the City um, internet connection for broadband sure. squads right now. Sure. Yeah. What happens right now is if this connection here goes down, the internet connection, or if Verizon would go down, which we've had for whatever purpose, these squad cars, these these fire trucks, they've lost all communication to Spillman. If this link goes down, they've lost all communication to Spillman. So there is no backup. There is no backup right now. 
as far as that goes. We could do a backup and then bring in another internet connection, let's say at the PD from a different provider, and we could do something that way, you know, to do that. But then in the whole chain, we'd have three internet connections. So that's what goes on. That would happen right now. Good question, Chief. Thank you. Um, likewise, um, for the Spillman server, where the main application is, I mean, for a backup server, Right now, there's one located at the courthouse or at the county. Um, eventually, it's the plan to put in a backup server. Where would be the place to house that? Obviously, you'd want to do it somewhere off-site. And if we have the pipeline you know, set up at the PD, we could have the backup server or the primary server and the backup server and switch back and forth um, you know, along that line. So that would all come in with the combined dispatch, which would give us disaster recovery if you know, something were to happen over here or a connection where they're going to be down for a period of time, we can switch over and service. And that's where the bottom scenario comes into play. Is you're going to hear in the other presentation, you know, running fiber between City Hall and the police department to connect them because right now that's on a wireless microwave link. So what we would do is we could run the gigabit fiber from here, to, from here to the police department and then use the microwave link as a backup so we'd have a redundant link through there. Additionally, what we could do is have our internet connection and the county's internet connection, you know, service all of these units. So if one would fail down, they could fail over and still get to the Spillman server. Or if this one would fail, they, they, could, they could come in to the city connection and go over and still get to the server, which would give us redundancy. As a, as, a, as a county services to be provided for, our, you know, police and fire that we could all take care of. Um, again, this was all brought up in the spirit and discussion of dispatching. Now, one thing which I brought up as we talked about fibers, uh, with the fiber, one thing to consider with the fiber is this is a big picture item, long term. I mean, fiber can last in the ground 10 to 20 years, you can get life out of it. It isn't like a three-year thing and we're going to get rid of it. The other thing with the fiber is the benefits we'd get is, you know, if we do it right, we can connect the MSB, uh, yeah, the MSB facility, the transit facility, all the ones where, we're going, where we'd route the path. So that way when the mesh, you know, for cold weather or whatever would happen, those, those buildings are not out of action for getting at, you know, our computer systems. Um, the other thing it would do is provide that sharing of technologies like we could go on a single phone system the PD has a great IP phone system and here we have an old centric system we can start leveraging and consolidating those technologies you know down to single things which makes them easier to manage as well as then you know between the county and the city get them on the same communication system the same phone system as well so the fiber you know isn't just for dispatching it's a part of it you know, it's a, it's a whole bigger picture that we can utilize it for as a highway for our data. Um, like I said, allow combining of communication systems. It allows for disaster recovery with Spillman, and then we can keep our response times. And we can increase performance to the other agencies so there's no bottlenecks running over um, the mesh or um, slow links. And again, it's the, the big part of it is it's an investment to leverage other applications between our sites. It's kind of like having, you know, plumbing in your house with um, quarter inch pipe and trying to take a shower. You're not going to get any pressure or any water. You know, you've got to have that pipeline. So the other thing, you know, to consider, like I said, disaster recovery. And this is kind of leading into the next, this is leading into the next um, presentation is dispatch. You know, it should be at, well, it should be at the same site, you know, where your server is. Uh, we have data replication in between, common network, so less um, variance to manage, and it's going to set the stage for other shared services activities if we want to take, you know, advantage of it. So, Dave, could you give some examples of maybe some other uh, shared service opportunities in the future? Well, the big one would be the technology. Excuse me. The big one would be. Uh, I could, where I see is, you know, technology and IT is, you know, we have 
all these servers here, all the servers there, over at the county, you know, it'd be a leverage of disaster recovery or a single email system where we can just all talk to each other, you know, singly with, within contact lists. Um, you know, eventually, you know, if we want to look at sharing applications, you know, instead of look, instead of um, downloading information back and forth between their financial system or ours or the whole, you know, the tax thing that we just went through with uh, another software. <coughs> use the same system and that way it's all there, it's easy to balance or quick, quicker to balance, quicker to reconcile. You know, so the technology piece would be the first groundwork to lay for it in other services to look at, is what it basically comes down to. Thanks. Okay. Any questions? I hope I didn't confuse you too much on this one. <laughs> Do you have anything else on this agenda item then, Dave? No. Okay, thank you. Next, we'll move into items for discussion and possible recommendation of the Common Council. Agenda item number 10, a presentation on the combined 9-11 dispatch proposal between Sheboygan County and the City of Sheboygan as presented to the City County Shared Services Committee on January 12th, uh, 2012. Uh, this will be presented by the City of Sheboygan uh, Chief of Police, Christopher Domogulski, and Dave Augustine, City of Sheboygan IT Manager. And I'd also like uh, Sheriff Preby and uh, Inspector Brookbauer maybe to come a little closer to the front in case we have to, uh, some questions for you. Chief and Dave, the floor is yours. What do is just press enter to go to the next slide. Good evening. So the first slide that we're gonna look at um, talks about uh, the cost of maintaining separate centers. Uh, first column there where it says county talks about um, the current costs off of uh, the 2012 budgets. So you can see the cost for the running the current county dispatch center, 875,000. And the cost to the next column would be for the city dispatch center. Uh, Use the mouse because they can't see you pointing at the screen. Over here in this column, 1.1 million, and then when you add those together, the, the cost is 1.9 million. As we move down, what we're trying to show here is in these columns is the is the cost of, of adding management and supervision to both the separate centers if we would continue to maintain separate centers and run them independently. So what, what's proposed is adding one manager and four supervisors at each place if we are gonna main, maintain separate centers and then those costs are added in to the costs above and then the totals down below. And then over here is adding those two costs together to get the final cost. I think um, we'll, we'll stop here and move on to the other scenarios and then we come up with a recommendation. It's probably the easiest way to explain why we think it's advantageous to do this and then you can ask questions from there. So this next slide is the cost of, of combined dispatch, keeping it um, a shared center at the city PD. So on this side over here, we have operational costs. Um, so you have the 24 dispatchers, uh, other non-salary costs, which are just um, office supplies, things like that. You get 1.7. Then we move down to the next series of things. And these are costs um, that we wanted to be transparent and show that these costs exist. These are um, things that are currently done within the independent centers that would have to be pulled out when the centers are combined. So here you have three secretaries at the PD. We have a front desk at the PD that does some clerical duties and deals with um, interfacing with customers as they come into the PD. That is currently done within our dispatch center. If we're gonna combine the, the, the centers, it's important that we pull those out because it's not it would be a, otherwise it would be a cost shift 
us shifting that over um, to the county. And we don't want to do that. We want, if we're creating a, a dispatch center, we want to pull out the things that the dispatch center isn't going to do and show those costs. So we're going to have to staff people to deal with customers that walk in and do some clerical functions. Below that is a line for cost for secretaries at the sheriff's department. Um, some of the things that they currently do in, in their center is warrant validation. That would be something that would get pulled out and there would be a cost to that. Um, then if you move down, then, then here we show again the cost of the supervision and then you add it together and that's the grand total of what it would cost. Um, the savings here, whether you see it as savings or not, is that now you have a layer of supervision present in the dispatch center that's combined that's not currently in place in either dispatch center as uh, separate centers. Over on this side, you see the one-time capital costs for creating the combined center at, at the city PD. These costs up here consist of costs of adding another council or dispatch position within the PD. And then you see the fiber connection down there, adding, uh, updating and adding 911 lines, repeaters, some small construction costs. And so the total one-time capital is, is there, 356000 The next slide shows the, the cost of creating a combined center at the county. On this side here, we're talking about all the same costs that we talked about on the last slide. And then on this side here is one-time capital costs for creating the center at the Sheriff's Department. And then on this slide, there's a financial comparison in summary. So it shows costs off of the first slide on the top line here. Um, separate center status quo with no dedicated supervision at either one. And then on this line with added management, if we both were to add um, that level of management at the separate centers and keep them separate. And then the cost 2.5, if we were to combine the centers and add the management, so then it shows a change in annual, annual cost is a decrease of 272000 I'll point out that that management, again, that management layer is not present at either one, so it's assuming that that is added. And then on below, below is, the, again, the capital investment for the two scenarios. Okay. The, the benefits of the combined dispatch is it does create some call processing efficiency in that it creates a single answering point so all the calls would go into one place rather than going into two separate possibilities. Um, faster dispatching with no phone transfers. 911 calls that come in wire, wirelessly for the city still come into the county and then get transferred over to the city so that's where we're talking about saving some time and not having to transfer. Um, the, the recent study that we did at the end of 2011 showed that there's at this point about 368 is the average calls monthly wireless 911s that get transferred. I think one thing to keep in mind there is that as technology keeps changing, more and more of those calls are gonna come in wirelessly rather than through a landline. I mean, it's estimated that it takes or say, would save about one to 1.5 minutes per call on average. And, and where that comes in is that when the call comes in, the dispatcher at the county doesn't pick it up and just automatically transfer it. They ask questions, enter inf information into the computer so that if, if something does um, happen where that call is dropped or if, if on a transfer the call is lost, we have that basic information so that somebody can try to recontact that party and, and has that information before that call is, is transferred. Um, so it would result in fewer dropped calls. Essentially, I, I uh, explained part of that. In the 2011 study, that count equates to about six calls per month that are dropped. And I'll point out that um, the calls are 
even, even with a combined center, those calls might be dropped because many of these calls that are dropped are dropped because of the way technology is. They get too far from a cell tower or something like that, and so that's likely <coughs> where a lot of the drop calls come from. Um, the big benefit in, in my eyes is the next point, supervision. Right now there's no dedicated supervision for this call center at the police department. It's done on an oversight basis by um, a shift commander that, that's sitting uh, in, in the PD. But the thing that, to point out here is that person has many, many duties, reviewing reports, monitoring calls that, that the squads are out on, um, reviewing arrests, talking about assignments that officers are on with them, coaching them into making the right decisions, reviewing decisions that they're making, doing all of those things. So we're talking about they're, they're really only a fraction of their time monitoring what's going on in the call center. And that is a big negative in my view. Sheriff's Department um, ha has the same situation, although they recently pulled uh, a position from a different part of the department to, to place it in there because they have such a need, the same need that we do, that, that there's dedicated supervision there. What the dedicated supervision provides is improved and consistent standardized training, better employee support and engagement, and so we're talking about simple things here. We're not talking about um, employees that aren't competent, that aren't talented and don't know what they're doing, but we're talking about multiple employees, 14 employees at the police department, 12 employees, at the sheriff's department and if there's nobody um, overseeing what they're doing and coaching them what happens is they start to go in in different directions so we have a process in place about how things should be if there's not somebody monitoring and coaching it people go in different directions when what we need is consistent processes with everybody doing things the same way um, employee support uh, uh, an employee has a problem something they don't understand or they're doing something wrong or they're not sure how they're doing it there needs to be somebody there that they can say, hey, can you give me a hand with this? I don't quite understand what I'm doing. How should I handle this? Those kinds of things. When there's not supervision in place to immediately deal with those things, they fester and grow and then blow up, and now we're, we're dealing with a situation that's bigger than it has to be. Um, employees get frustrated and, and burnt out from things like that, so I, I think it's important it delivers a better service to the public if there's somebody that's making th sure that, that things are consistent and standardized. Um, emergency medical dispatching comes in um, more um, of on a, on a economy of scales thing is, is where I would say that comes in easier. You have more people that, it, now that you have a, a bigger management system to be able to support that and make sure, again, that things are standardized, that there's uh, quality control and things like that in place. Um, standard operating procedures, uh, more consistent procedures, because there's people there to monitor them and make sure that people understand what they're doing, do the coaching that's needed, um, identify problems and provide training to address those problems when they're noted. Um, improved coordination comes in in greater situational um, awareness. If all the dispatchers are in the same place all the time, taking the calls when, when something happens in, in Sheboygan Falls that is connected to something that happens in Sheboygan or something that happens in Sheboygan that's connected to Kohler or to Plymouth or vice, you know, anywhere in the county, all these people are together saying, oh, you know what, I took something similar or last week, last week or yesterday or earlier today, and that information gets shared quicker and faster, better between all the departments. Um, by going to the combined dispatch, it'll allow us to have a legitimate backup center. Um, right now, we serve as backup centers to each other, but the problem is there's not consistent processes. Things aren't handled those, the same, so if something happens at the Sheboygan Police Department where it goes down and we need to transfer the calls to the county, we do things differently. By combining them, our processes are the same, and then there's really no loss. It's shifting people from one center to the other and things operate the same way. Same thing vice versa if there's a if something would go down at the county and they had to transfer their calls to the city. Different processes. People would notice that there's a difference, that there's a change. If it's a combined center and we're just shifting the calls to the different center, 
there's, there's really, it's a, not a bump in the road. Nobody's gonna know that the one center went down and we shifted it to the other place. It's the same people dealing with the thing so that you have more built-in redundancy and better redundancy. Um, EOC can be housed in the backup center. Right now the EOC is at the fire department. So we have two centers and then the EOC at the fire department that will allow us to take the backup center and create that as the EOC. So then we only have two locations rather than three. Um, built in redundancy, I talked about this before, but it builds in redundancy in, in a bunch of ways. One is that we have all employees that all operate off the same standard procedures and same processes. Um, we already have the same records management system, but that, that's all a redundancy. The radio system is a redundancy. Dave talked about the advantages of adding the fiber and building in their redundancy for the mobile broadband and the internet. So if something goes down, there's a built-in redundancy that's not there today that will be there. Um, allows for technology standardization. Big part of this is as things, um, technology changes and we update things, we have to update the radio system. It gives us a chance to do it all at once <coughs> rather than doing it twice or doing it at one place rather than at two or three places. Um, in the last presentation, he talked about the fiber connection, eliminates some duplication of effort. It allows forces in, in some ways, departments to get closer together and do more collective planning and operations instead of being separate and doing their thing separately. And then as things are updated, there's an annual cost avoidance when adding the management function in the shared dispatch scenario rather than doing it separately at the two. That's where the economy of scales again come in and we're able to, to save. Any questions about anything that I talked about so far? Any questions from the alderman? Uh, Chief, I have one. Uh, could you just kind of go over what your uh, daily operation is now? How many uh, dispatchers do you have? Uh, how many councils do you use? How many do you have? And uh, that type of thing? At the city, there's, there's four councils. We have three people working on first and second shift, two people working on third shift. The reason that there's three on, on first and second shift is because one of those three works at the front desk. Um, so there's really two people in the dispatch center at all times. There's a third at the front desk. One of the uh, positive things that we have is that person that works the front desk is, is a trained dispatcher. So if things get busy or something's going on, they can flop back into the center and, and sit down and help with the dispatching. Yep. Sheriff's Department, there's two dispatchers working all the time. Um, so, like I said, at the city, there's, there's four dispatch councils. So what we would do is take the two dispatchers from each place and put them in there. That would use up all the councils. We're recommending that there's a fifth council added, and that's for a bunch of reasons. One reason is, is if there's training that has to go on, you need that extra council so that you can provide the training there. Um, again, redundancy, if one of the councils goes down and it needs to be repaired, we can shift that over onto that fifth council and, and let, so there's no disruption. And then the other reason is so that the supervisor can monitor what's going on from that council, hear what's going on on the calls, see how people are dispatching, and then again, if there's a spike in calls or, or there's a major incident going on, then they can step in and get involved and, and help assist with that, so that builds in that redundancy. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, our recommendation is that we combine the dispatch centers into a single center managed by the Sheriff's Department and that we locate the center at the Sheboygan Police Department initially, we staff the center with the appropriate management and staff, that we start out there, and one of the big things starting out there, the important thing is to develop and implement the appropriate processes and workflows, standard operating rating procedures, uh, measurements for um, establishing combined peak operating efficiency. Once that's in place, so we're, really what we're talking about is taking two separate centers, putting them in one place, operating them separately as we train, cross-train the people so that 
we get to this point that I talked about where everybody is on the same page, does everything the same way, um, learns the streets or areas that they don't know now, so that allows for all of that to occur. Once, once I, my, I don't know if you want me to say this or not, <laughs> the, the number that I threw out is I think it's probably about somewhere between a 12 and 18 month process for that to go on, to develop all those processes, get everybody up to speed and, and, and trained on it, integrated so they're operating together as, as one center rather than two separate centers. Then the second part of our recommendation is, is longer term, and that's that at that point, as part of the radio upgrade or in conjunction with the radio upgrade that needs to go on, is to relocate the shared dispatch center at a county facility in conjunction with that. So start out here, get everything, all those processes and things built up so that when it shifts over to the county, your, the disruption isn't, isn't big. So it's just then moving the operation where everybody understands what the processes are and how things are done over into a new center that's added on to the sheriff's department. If I could just ask a question of the sheriff or the inspector, if you could kind of just go over what your dispatch center is doing right now, how many councils you have, and how you, how you uh, staff those during the course of a day, that type of thing, just for a kind of a comparison of what we're doing with the PD now. Sure. Um, we have two dispatchers all the time during all three shifts, and we have 12, so when we can, we have a third. And the purpose of the third dispatcher is for validation and warrant entry. And that is their responsibility for that, uh, for that shift. Uh, we have three councils. Um, it's questionable if we have room for any more, which justifies the, the having to build on. Um, we do not have a dispatcher, a backup dispatcher. Today was a prime example where we had um, a deputy that was uh, serving some papers and we had a, an armed individual or an individual that, uh, uh, what should I say, uh, we had a standoff, let me put it that way. We ended up with a SWAT team and at the same time uh, during that call we actually had another incident involving a gun. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have a third dispatcher that was actually in, in service that was able to give a hand. Typically what would happen, those two dispatchers would be on their own uh, with the on-duty shift commander helping out wherever possible. However, it's not as, as fluent as three trained dispatchers working together, uh, dealing with everything that is that's coming in because those phone calls uh, for non-emergencies and other emergency calls still keep coming in during this uh, SWAT incident that we had going on today. So uh, we were fortunate enough to have that there, but we always don't have that. Thank you. Alderman Hammond. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'd like to uh, first off thank uh, the chief, the inspector, and the sheriff, and uh, everybody else that was involved in this kind of this smaller group, Dave and Jim Modio and um, Adam Payne, uh, put in a, quite a bit of time and effort um, when we put all this together. But I wanted to make a couple comments as, as we look at this, because some will look at this from the outside and say, you know, things are running fine now. You know, why do we need this extra layers of management? And, um, you know, I may have been one of those people at one time, but after listening to uh, Inspector Bruckbauer, the chief and the sheriff, um, it's pretty evident to me that uh, we've been living on borrowed time. Um, I know, Chief, you made a comment um, in the uh, Shared Services Committee meeting about the Broad Days um, accident where the car came through during the Broad Days parade. And, the handoff between the county and the city and some of those types of things would have been avoided with a common dispatch uh, center. Um, could you, one or both, maybe just elaborate on, on that? Um, I know you kind of, it's in the slides and we kind of talked about it, but how important that really is. Um, right now we have sworn officers that are supervising, correct, in both dispatch centers? Yeah, I, I guess you can say that even though we have one uh, supervisor in the dispatch center, she's not there all the time. So yes, it would be the uh, shift commander or who's ever in the shift commander's office at the time to actually uh, assist in, in supervising the dispatchers. Do you have something to do? Yeah, you, I, I, you know, I could, there's a whole bunch of different areas I could go into. I, I don't want to uh, send out the message that, that the dispatchers that, that work for either one of our departments 
aren't competent, they aren't talented, and they don't do a great job. That's, that's not the point. The point is, is that we are not properly s supporting them, and by not having dedicated supervision to oversee them and, and to really assist them, that's where I see the risk coming in. There's problems that can be dealt with very easily in a day-to-day -day basis to, to assist them in, in delivering better service. That, that isn't happening because there is no supervision there. So what happens is a problem starts and it festers and it builds and then all of a sudden myself or somebody else in my staff has to drop everything that they're doing, put it aside and go deal with the problem. And now because the problem is a bigger thing, it's, it's not a 10, 10 or 15 minute um, situation that, that's dealt with, it's a longer term thing. So we're wasting a lot of our time that we could be spending more productively in, in other areas because we have to keep pulling people off, supervisors off, to deal with, with things that really we should have um, proper supervision to deal with is the one thing. And then the other thing that the alderman touched on is, and I touched on a, on a little bit here, is really that situational awareness. And it's, you know, it's something that we're dealing with in other areas of our department too. And, and when I talk to the community and I think when I talk to you, one of the, the really important things is, is I got 80 officers besides myself that are out on the street that have all kinds of information. The problem is most of that information is contained right up here. And so what we struggle with is getting that information out of those officers' heads and getting them to share it with each other. So if we have whatever it is, criminal damages happening over in a certain part of the city, that one officer who works that area might know about it but unless we're talking about it as a department, everybody doesn't know about it. So it might be another officer that gets sent to deal with it. And there's that disconnect where we have the information that we need to, to stop what is occurring and, and deal with it properly. But if we're not communicating properly, that information isn't being shared. And so we're solving things um, 10 days later than we really should. This is the same thing that I'm talking about in the, in the dispatch center is that there's things that occur throughout the county that aren't necessarily noticed right away because all of those people are in different places so they're not talking and saying, oh, you know, me overhearing BB taking a call and saying, oh, yep, I had something like that last week over in this community so that now those two departments know and are talking and working together to solve the issue. I think a couple other things with this too is is the backup and the redundancy and Dave touched on that a little bit in his presentation but right now um, it's kind of scary to me that if that link goes down we have no communication with our patrol officers um, you know so having as part of this that fiber optic line going in and the microwave as the backup um, helps build that redundancy having a server at the county, the server at the city for the Spillman system. I mean, all of these types of things that you know many people kind of assume are just in place, you know, aren't there right now. And this process would build a lot of that infrastructure to be able to do that. So, um, you know, again, I think uh, there's a couple you know non-financial reasons to take a look at this um, you know more seriously because again, it'd be easy to step back and say we don't need to add management; it's working fine. Again, from the outside looking in. Um, but I think, uh, and I agree, the dispatchers are doing a great job. Um, that it's not a slight on them, but um, anything where you don't have consistent management ends up kind of, as you mentioned, everybody starts going in their own different directions, putting in their own processes in the lack of a, a standardized process procedure. So, um, so. I just wanted to touch about when we talk about that link going down, we're talking about data. So, so they're not losing communication. They could still talk to each other on the radio, Apologize, yeah. but they're not getting the data link is down. So all the data that we spent all of this, this money on and all this time training them on, trying to get them the information, that's just what's going down. So, and, it, and that includes things like our, our paperless ticket systems that we went to, the same thing to try to speed up the processes, take out um, a lot of the data input that goes in, that's what's going down. So then we gotta go back to handwriting tickets and entering those tickets and, and all of those kinds of things. Alderman Sampson, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody involved um, in the whole entire process. <clears throat> this is certainly uh, one of those topics that can raise the temperature of a room fairly quickly, and it seems to have been a pretty hot topic lately. <clears throat> so everybody's willingness to work together and keep the channels of communication open is actually very appreciated uh, for something I think is pretty important with this as well, because communication, I can't think of a better 
area for very high levels of communication than the communication center for emergency dispatch and, and things like that that actually serve the, the cities and, and, and the county. I guess my question would be, just so I understand how it would work, the physical dispatch center would be initially housed then at the police department, the new building. And because there are some specific job uh, duties that would the sheriff's department needs to keep, they would still maintain some folks over at the current dispatch center right now for, for county? Correct. Okay. So, every, so most of the operation is going to be over at the city. Uh, why would you have to, if you're going to, if, if the idea would be to add on another uh, <coughs> um, call center, I guess, for, to make five, why would, why would the long-term plan, if that's going to work out, if that seems to be adequate, why would, why would the long-term plan then to get rid of that and then move it to a completely separate facility where now you would have that new dispatch center that we added on to in addition to the dispatch center that we would be using for specific jobs over at the county? Why would we have to consider moving to another location? Because I think in the, in the long run, you're going to outgrow it even here that the, the, the space that would be suitable for now, adding in another council, good for 10 years or so, but looking down, I guess the way I'm looking at it as a visionary looking down the road, we may be facing this again 15, 20 years, and we're gonna go, well, we're out of space, now what are we going to do? Uh, this way here, we're projecting ahead, we're thinking ahead, we're preparing for the future, and giving adequate space uh, now versus waiting for a, a time where we're having to look for additional space. The, the, the PD, and I, I'll let the chief speak for himself, but the PD uh, is going to be limited in growth too, so it may be good to start here, but not necessarily 15, 20 years as the city grows, as the county continues to grow and there's a greater need for more and more uh, councils. Uh, I, I think that, ch I'll let the chief speak, but I, I think you're, you're limited on what you're going to be able to do versus uh, an expansion at the at the county where we'll be prepared for continued expansion uh, the, for years to come. The other thing with that too, Kevin, was that a obviously the cost is less now. But at some and this might be where you're going with this this inspector. But we have to do a significant radio upgrade, and these all of these councils are going to have to be replaced right around that time. Um, and from a command and control standpoint, they'd rather have their employees in their building um, with them. Um, so when all of that upgrading has to happen, it just makes sense to make that the point to move it over there. Uh, that's correct. It, having it at the city and having us run it does create some logistical issues for us. It's, it, we can deal with it, especially in the short term. It's not any type of a deal killer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Long term, it is much more efficient for us to have it housed on our campus. The other issue as far as is, is having it right away at the city is that is the most economical way to get it up and running and the fastest way to get up and running now. Because we have to add on a significant addition to our building, about 600 square feet, that the construction is going to take time. So it's just much faster to start it up here. You still are going to need a backup center. So whether you start at the city and now turn it into your backup center or we have to do remodeling and do a backup center at the county. It really, it almost seems initially like maybe you're thinking we're going to put this money in and we're just going to leave it. You need the backup center. So whether it starts initially as a primary at the city and moves the primary to, this, to the county and the city becomes backup, or you leave it at the city, you're going to still have to remodel and create a bigger area because we don't have an adequate backup at the county as we operate right now. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, one thing I just wanted to go over again when you were talking about the benefits, we talked about it very briefly, is that faster dispatching with no phone transfers between the city and the county, the estimated time saved is a minute to uh, one, uh, a minute to a minute and a half per call. And I guess the importance of that would be for, let's say, for example, a cardiac arrest case, to get that ambulance there, and our ambulance service has excellent response times now, but to, have, to be able to save an extra minute to a minute and a half would be critical for that patient's quality of life to get that ambulance there that much sooner. So if we can, if we can save a minute to a minute and a half, that's a huge, huge benefit in my mind. And huge. It speaks for itself. Yep. 
was there any other questions? And then, uh, and I think the last thing that we wanted to cover then was the proposed uh, timeline for this project. Chief, did you want to handle that? Sure. Um, it was suggested that we put together a timeline. I, I think it's important so that everybody gets an idea of what we're looking at and, and doing it. So the timeline is there. It speaks for itself pretty much. The, the first part was getting the shared services committee to approve or not approve. Um, the next is really getting uh, the, the council and, and the county board to decide to go forward with it. I think one of the important things is it's, this has been a, a long-term topic. We need to make a decision of, of which way we're going to go, and we don't need to drag it out anymore. We just really need to make a decision one way or the other. Um, so what we're hoping is, is that by April 30th we have that worked out. There's still other work that needs to be done as far as the city and county working out um, the, the agreement and how to pay for it and, and those things, but really we need to, to get something going. And then we have um, about 13 or 14 months to, to really stand it up and, and get it operational is what we're looking at. I know the inspector probably wanted a little bit more than a, than a year, more like 18 months, but we've kind of, <laughs> we've kind of, adjusted that as much as we can but I think one of the, the important things to put the timeline together like this is to create that sense of urgency that to say hey we can't keep pushing this down the road we need to make some decisions so we can get on with the planning and, and implementation if that's where we're going and then long-term plan I think that date is is subject to change again as as the radio upgrade goes in that's all going to be long together then so thanks chief Alderman Hammond. Thank you. I think it's important, and, and the chief hit it right in the head, you know, to finally you know, take a vote. This has been kind of uh, kicked around in this area for, from what I can understand, the better part of 40 years, and many of us in this room have been involved with it in various different levels. Um, I think the group um, and then the recommendation from the Shared Services Committee is a good one. Um, is it perfect? Absolutely not. I don't think anybody over there standing there would say it's absolutely perfect. Um, but it does accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. It gets the management into the, into the dispatch center, which is uh, solely needed. Um, it gets us the redundancy we need, um, an operational emergency or an operational EOC, um, and then again a good backup system. So um, I hope everybody uh, will will um, vote yes for this, um, so we can stick along, so we can stick on our timeline. Any other questions? Thank you, Chief. Uh, with no further discussion, I would entertain a motion from one of the aldermen on what we want to do with the uh, with the presentation. Alderman Hammond. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would move the, that we recommend to the full council um, to accept the proposal for the shared services um, combined dispatch. Second. We have a motion and a second under discussion. I have Alderman Decker's light flashing here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. They got goofed up on the board. Did you have something else? No. Okay. We have a motion and a discussion. Uh, is there any further discussion? Uh, Alderman Kopp, would you call the roll, please? Actually. Do you have something? Um, the other part of it, and again, the chief kind of alluded to it, was if we go back in the slides, is taking a look at the infrastructure cost, the one-time capital cost of having the, the facility shared at the city PD. The big part of that, obviously, is a uh, 225 for the fiber connection. Um, in our capital improvements budget of the two million, we've only allocated about 1.1 million. So I would like to amend um, my motion to, since this will be housed at the city's facility to um, also uh, cover the one-time capital cost through the capital improvements um, budget um, of the 356855 It was already proposed to the capital improvements. It was just uh, tabled, um, especially the fiber, as part of this conversation. So I would, I'd would make an amendment. What was that number again? Oh, 356855 
And Alderman Hammond, that would be the listing here, starting out with an update on 911 lines with the 6445 reading down for the grand total of the 356. Is that Let's start saying? up at the council, at council, council package, Positron. Oh, it start, I'm yeah. sorry, it starts yeah. way up on top there, okay. And that way the, the county uh, would have the um, ongoing costs, obviously, and, and um, the portion of the levy, our levy, um, would be allocated to them for that um, going forward. They wouldn't be saddled with that one-time expenditure of cost, and we would take care of that. The entire 356 is in capital improvements? Not the entire, um, so but there's room in there for that. For the fi there was, a, I believe there was money in the capital improvements for the fiber connection? Correct. yes. So then your subcommittee, or, or you, or uh, I guess Mr. Amodio and the county would be working, well, we would be working out where we're gonna come up with the rest of this money for the other items then? I would propose that we take that out of capital improvements as capital well. Capital improvements are? Correct. Okay. All right. So I would admit, uh, my amendment would be that we accept this and um, also um, pay the three, you know, pay for the 356855 to get that facility up and running. Um, and then again, the county would assume the ongoing costs of, of the um, shared dispatch center. Is that okay with the second? Yes. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Alderman Cox, you want to, you, you want to, well, why don't you just read back what the motion is so we all understand it? You got it right. Um, Alderman Hammond, uh, to recommend a full council to accept the proposal from the shared services. Uh, he amended, amended his motion and a second. Uh, to cover a one-time startup cost of $356,855,000 um, out of the capital improvements and road fiber connections. So throw that in there too. Okay. <laughs> fiber connection at all. Okay. Okay. Boring? Okay. Uh, aye. Carlson? Aye. Decker? Aye. Hammond? Aye. Hammond? Aye. Heideman? Aye. Kopp, aye. Riesler? Aye. Sampson? Aye. Vanderweele? Aye. First, uh, okay. Uh, all eyes. All eyes. Motion carries. Next thing on the agenda is the meet next meeting date. That'll be determined, and I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.